to share for a few minutes about what baptism is all about. Because really what we saw today uh, in the tank was a representation of what Jesus has done for them. Um, today, I want to share that baptiz- baptism really is all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. And re- it's a, <laughs> really, it's, it's a burial service. It's a burial service of the old life and a celebration of the new life that's with Christ. So when we put them under the water, that's, it's really highly symbolic um, of what Jesus did on the cross for them. Just to say the old life has been buried. Um, and as they come out of the water, the new life is now in operation. Christ in them. As Ella so beautifully shared that, that Bible passage, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. The old has gone, the new is here. And, uh, and I love that. I love hearing their stories. Um, wasn't that great where Ella just shared, she, said, she said, shared that line, all of, God put all my broken pieces back together. Did you hear that? And, uh, and that was just so good. And that has been my experience as well And preparing for a baptism service. I remember about my own baptism um, when I was 18 years ago, half a life, nearly half my lifetime ago, I turned 36 this year. I know I look far younger. Thank you. I received that. Um, but remember, that was my story as well, that, that I grew up uh, going to church with my family. My parents are strong uh, believers and, and showed it in their life as well. And by the time it came to my teenage years, it was fair to say that I wasn't very interested in, in Christianity or God and was more interested in living the way I wanted to live. And the way all of my schoolmates were living, I really just wanted to fit in and do what they were doing. And so I guess the best way to put it is I lived my own way for a number of years. But while I was doing that and while I was living my life and, and doing all the things that um, people do, I found that I couldn't, couldn't shake the reality of God. No matter where I went, no matter what I did, um, it, I still couldn't shake the idea of that God is real, that he's interested in me, and the things that he says about this life and about me ring true. And there was, uh, talking to other people and seeing other things out there, I'm like, there was no other alternative to Christianity. I, could, I didn't find anything as fulfilling. I didn't see anything that was truer. And that was my story. And, uh, and came to Christ and was baptized, I think when I was, yeah, when I was 18. And, uh, and uh, just for a show of hands, who, who here has been baptised? You've been baptised? A lot of people. And uh, so you really, when I talk about baptism, you can just switch off, you can go to sleep, you can scroll on your phone for the next 10 minutes while I share. That's fine, you're off the hook. Um, no, I, I, my hope is that as we talk about baptism, that you'll remember your story as well. You'll remember your story about what God has done for you through Jesus Christ and where he's brought you from and what, what the difference now, now that you have been saved, as we say, now that you have been forgiven and received that free gift of forgiveness and new eternal life, that God also has a plan for you. It doesn't stop there. God's plan wasn't just to forgive you and wash away all your sins and then just make you feel good, guilt-free. Oh, sweet, off we go. Same, same kind of life goes now. No, he actually has a plan for you, a blueprint for your life to follow that is the best, the best way forward. Is that okay? Jesus really does make all the difference. Um, at my baptism, I still remember, I, I didn't get off so easily. When, when I had my baptism as an 18-year-old, I think they, they got me up and they, I, need, I got to share for about 10 minutes. So Ella and Alicia, you thought you were nervous. Imagine how nervous I was feeling. So I remember getting up to share my story and one of the bible verses that i shared was from psalm 40 um, which is on the screen which talks about our which for me represented what life with god what life without god was all about how that felt what the reality was without god and uh, without jesus in my life um, it was like being stuck in the mud And we read that here from the psalmist. He says, I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the pit and out of the mud and mire. And for me, this is my experience. 
I felt when I was living my own way, then I had the entanglements of sin and selfishness in my life. It felt like I was stuck. And I was stuck and I couldn't get out. But then the good news of the gospel, that Jesus meets us where we are. He doesn't leave us in a point of stuckness. He loves, as, as we heard again, one of those precious Bible verses, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, for whoever believes in him shall not be stuck eternally any longer or perish, but have eternal life. And I love that. He then, he set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. That's what God did in me. And for those, all those who raised your hand before, that's what God did in you as well. This is the good news of the gospel. Everyone say gospel. 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 What do you think of when you think of gospel? I think of an um, a American church with the gospel singers um, and a choir and wearing the big robes. I'd love to go to church like that one time. Maybe, can we do that, Laura, Tanya? Maybe have a gospel choir one morning. That'd be fantastic. One of the key parts of the gospel, um, and what I, what I like to say, and I've said this before, before the gospel, which means good news, before the gospel is good news, it's kind of sobering news or bad news before it gets to be good news. Do you know what I mean? And uh, I want to share a Bible passage of where Jesus talks about baptism. In Mark 16, this was just after, this is after he lived a perfect life where he trained his disciples, when he went around healing the sick and doing good and doing all the things that he did, went to the cross, rose again and appeared to his disciples. This is um, what we confess and what we believe as Christians. And in Mark 16, if we've got um, the passage there, Jesus appears and he says this, hey, this is your marching orders now. Now I've got something for you to do. He says, go into all the world and preach, share, tell people the gospel. The good news of who I am and what I've done and what that means for you. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. So you see there that baptism is linked with believing. And Charles Spurgeon says this. He says that baptism is the outward expression of inward faith. So the two are interlinked. It's like you believe, you have inward faith. It naturally comes out with an outward expression. That's what true Belief and faith does. It affects your life and it comes out and that's what baptism is. And, and But then it says this, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. Now that's a bit we don't like as much, do we? We like the bit about, yeah, Jesus is alive. Jesus loves you. Jesus saves. But here's the context of all those things, the, the spiritual reality that Jesus come to share and part the key part of the gospel, the good news actually started with news that wasn't so good, but it was real. He's saying, hey, you're current before Jesus. If not for Jesus, you were stuck in the mud. You were stuck in a way that you couldn't get out. No matter what you could do, no matter how hard you tried, no matter how good you were, how caring you were, no matter how many community programs that you signed, signed up for, no matter how many little young old ladies that you helped walk across the road, there's no matter how many of those things you did, you couldn't get yourself unstuck. In Ephesians, it talks about that actually because of our sinful disposition, because of sin, which is our rebelliousness and our disinterestedness in God and obeying Him and living His way and having a relationship with Him, we've all um, proverbially stuck up our finger to God and said, I don't want to have anything to do with you. That's a good picture of what sin really is, the heart of it. You can use that. You can tweet it if you like. But this, Jesus is saying, this is the reality that for those who have rejected me and those who have not believed and been baptized, then they are enemies, self-proclaimed enemies of God. They are not in relationship with God. And this is an issue. And sometimes we can like to share the gospel and, and just share part of it, but not all of it. And we can say, go around and say to people, say, hey, hey, hey. I've got the gospel. Jesus is the answer. Oh, yeah, believe that, believe that. Jesus is the answer. God loves you. God loves you. Jesus is the answer. When you say Jesus is the answer, people would rightly then say back to you, yeah, Jesus is the answer, but what's the problem? I've got a great life. What's the problem? 
and we can share this aspect of the good news and the only part of that is that you've missed out the key part, the first bit. The problem is that there is a problem. And, and this is, I think we can characterise God and Jesus into like a Gandhi type figure. Uh, that he's just a good teacher. And, uh, I remember on uh, the progressive uh, alternative radio program or radio channel that I used to listen to, um, Triple J, and they were hosting a, a segment on their, one of the segments called Hack, where they put it out to the listeners and they said, ask the question, what do you think of Jesus? I mean, that is a great question. I'm like, that's what we're trying to do as a church, get people to think about those things. Anyway, they, they put it out there and the people would call in. And I was really surprised because what they found is that overwhelmingly, in fact, every single person who called in said they liked Jesus. Isn't that interesting? I was not expecting that. And, and they talked about it and they sort of followed it up and they got a little bit deeper into it. I mean, why do you like Jesus? And they all talked about the, him as a teacher, um, po- positive moral teacher. And, I, you know, really, and it, was like, it was like this Gandhi-esque figure. But they left out, obviously, the core components that Jesus is God, that he died and he rose again, these things that... So they shared about not, not the full host- historical picture. And I think sometimes... We can get this picture of Jesus that leaves out those core components, that Jesus actually had a lot of difficult things to say. He talked about our sinful disposition and the consequence of those things in not being in relationship with God. And this can be a problem. And so Jesus had the same problem of, hey, I want to tell you the good news. How do I tell good news to someone who doesn't realise they need good news? How do I get people unstuck if they don't realise that they are stuck. How do you do that? How do you do that? And we read a passage in the Gospels in Luke 5 that talks about Jesus encountering this problem. And he, he called a tax collector, one of the notorious sinners of the time. He calls him to follow him. And then this guy agrees and comes in and hosts a party with all of his friends for Jesus and the religious lawyers of the, the day. Um, questioned the disciples and they said, why is Jesus eating with these bad people? And then Jesus replies um, by saying this in verse 31. Jesus answered them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have come not to call the righteous or not those who've got it all together, but sinners to repentance. He said, it's not the healthy people who need a doctor. It's not the people who think that they aren't stuck, that I want to get unstuck. It's, he's saying this is a problem for us as well, is that unless we realise our need for Jesus, unless we realise that we are stuck and in that plate, we are, we are sinful and separated from God and outside of relationship with Him, unless we realise that, we will never call upon Jesus to save us. We will never realise that we need His forgiveness, that we need His new life. How do, and that's my question for us, how, that's the challenge that we've got. How do we share the gospel with a Western culture that is very satisfied with the things they are? How do we communicate the gospel to our world, to people who don't think they need help? I think a big part of it is just praying for them and praying that God will, help them to see their lost situation. I also think it's about sharing our testimonies like the one we've heard today. How powerful is that? To share about our own story of, hey, before God, I, the old me, was living my own way. My own God was living to please myself and not wanting anything to do with God, breaking His commandments, whatever, I'll live my life, YOLO, as the kids say. (laughs) No, they don't, they don't say that anymore. I feel like I'm about five or 10 years behind culture. But I think that's okay. God still loves me. I think sharing our story and explaining the reality of sin, because of what our world thinks is sin, is, they, is this like indulgence of like, oh, that, that dark chocolate fondue was sinfully good. <laughs> As if it's like, that's what sin is, it's indulging in something like that. I'm like, no, there's much more to it. It's a relational concept. 
a relational concept of how uh, we have rejected God. And Pastor Bill always shares that sin could be better spelt S and with a capital I, N. Independence, our desire to reject God and, and live independently from Him, as well as doing the wrong thing. And so this is an issue. And, and then we can think, oh, well, but the rest of us can think, oh, but I'm, actually, I'm not too bad. And we can use the rest of the population to measure ourselves against it. And might, well, I know these people over here, you know, who I'm not doing as bad as them. So I'm actually trying to be a good person. And I think most of us would say, most people would say that in our culture. But here's the thing, trying to be good enough and to overcome the sin issue in our life that the Bible talks about is like, the best analogy I heard was like trying to reach Port Lincoln over the water. You think about how far that is. You can't see it. Only, well, you, most of the time you can't see it. It's like trying to jump to Port Lincoln by taking a running jump off the Grange jetty. And, you know, given all your effort. You no, know, it doesn't matter how good you are. It doesn't matter how, if you're an Olympic long jumper, you're only going to get a few metres further than me. And it's, even with your very best efforts, we cannot bridge that chasm that's required to overcome the sin issue in our life. But here we are and here our culture is try, thinking that we can, oh, if I just try a bit harder, if I just try and be a bit nicer, if I just try and do more good things than wrong things, then I'm going to be acceptable. But in fact, the bad news in the gospel is that none of us are good enough. We have desperately fallen short that we have rejected God and that the penalty for sin is eternal separation from Him. That we've, sin has stained us in a way that we can't possibly fix. But the good news of the gospel is that Jesus didn't leave us in this state. He said, although you are dead in your sin, although you can't make yourself right, I love you so much that I'm going to do something about your stuckness. I'm not gonna leave you as you are. I have compassion for you. I have mercy for you. I see you as valuable that I'm gonna do something about the problem. And then we have the Easter story, of course, where God Himself comes. Jesus lays down His life and dies, ex experiences a cruel death on the cross. Wow. Pastor Tim Keller puts it this way. Of those two sides of the gospel, one of my favourite quotes that I've quoted it many times before and I'll quote it many times again. The gospel is this, that we are more sinful and more flawed in ourselves than we ever dared to believe. We're more flawed. There's nothing we can do about it. Yet at the very same time, we are more loved and accepted in Jesus Christ than we ever did hope. That's, this is the good news, folks. Not just that God loves us and that we're special to Him, but that we're more flawed and more desperate for our need for Him. But those two things together, He says, oh, I've done something about it. You are valuable to me. I love that. I love that. Um, last week, I, uh, something terrible happened. The coffee machine, the church coffee machine died. <laughs> it needed a resurrection. And here's this thing, this, you've got to believe this thing, it is not a pretty machine. It's about 30 years old. It has been, it has been resurrected many times. And so I was having a conversation with Char, who runs the, co the coffee shop. And, and I'm like, I was actually celebrating. I'm like, it's, it's finally died. Come on, can we just get rid of it and get a new machine? <laughs> Well, I've been petitioning for years. But here's the thing, this is not the disposition that God has for us. He didn't see us in our broken state, in our sinful state, in our stuck state and said, that's it, bad luck, getting rid of you. He saw something valuable in us that He loved and that He's like, oh, I can do something with that. And this is like the coffee machine that here late on Friday night after everyone had gone home, I see Char and Tim with the lid off the coffee machine, getting new parts in there, trying to fix it, pulling out wiring. And they got the coffee machine going. <laughs> <Did they? laughs> 
But here's the thing, they saw value in that thing that I didn't see value in. And that this is what God does with us, is that He puts great value in our life, so much so that He would die on the cross for us. This is the good news of the Gospel, that He can bring new life in us. Although the old life is gone, there's a burial for the old Sam, Christ puts His life in us. That now His life is operational in us. Isn't that good? And if you've never had your sins forgiven, if you don't have a relationship with God, and if this is ringing true, then you can respond to Him today. And this is what I talk about. I love Christianity and the Bible. I'm, I'm so convinced how it talks about sin it actually explains the human condition like no other philosophy does. No other religion does. It actually explains. This is why I have the problems I have. I'm not just a good person. I'm a, I'm a mixture. I'm good and bad. And Paul talks about this in Romans 7, doesn't he? Where he talks about his own struggle and he said, I know the good things that I want to do and yet I can't do it. There's times where I get drawn in the other direction. What is that? Sin. We have this in us. And that the Bible and Christianity explains perfectly what our issues are. But then also what the solutions are. I love that God doesn't leave us where He finds us. And that the story of baptism is not just that we're sinful and that we're forgiven, but also that we have new life in Him. And that once we have been forgiven, God says, okay, the job's only half done. Now I want you to go and live for me. I've got a new plan for you. Romans 6 talks about this. He's saying that you, your sinful self has been co-crucified with Christ. The old has gone the new is here. And this is the response now that you are born again. In verse 13, it says this. Our response is to offer every part of yourself to Him as an instrument of righteousness. And that word instrument is the idea of not a musical instrument, it's, it's a weapon or a useful tool. And, he, and another translation puts it that give yourself completely to God. And that sin was your old master, you used to live for yourself, but now you have a new master. Now you have a new master. Now you have new marching orders to live for Him. Now that He has conquered you with His love, you need to live for Him. In 1 Corinthians 6, it says, You are not your own. You've been bought or ransomed with a price. Therefore, honour God with your body. It's this idea of now everything we have as those people who have been forgiven and have new life, is for God. Is that the desire of your heart? To live completely for Him? Do you know that you're not your own master anymore? That He is your master and that He has a good plan for your life? In Ephesians 2, it talks about this. It's by grace that we've been saved through faith. And then he goes on to talk about and say that God has pre prepared good works for you to do. He's prepared them in advance for you to do. I wonder, have you been stepping into all that God has for you today? I'm going to invite the band to come and join me on stage as we wrap up. Give yourself completely to God. Isn't God so good that He doesn't leave us where He found us? Though we were stuck like in the sun, we were stuck in the mud, He rescues us out and He gives us brand new life, a new plan and a new blueprint for us. Are we living for ourselves? Are we living for God? Why don't we bow our heads and close our eyes as we reflect on baptisms, as we reflect on the cross, and we as we reflect on what Jesus has done for us. I love that passage in Romans 6, which says, now offer yourself as instruments to God. Offer yourself as instruments to God. God who is, did not spare His Son, who laid, came and laid down His life, who gave everything to bring us back. What will our response be? Seeing your response is this, to be a living sacrifice. There's a word, words in a beautiful old hymn called take my life 
which talks about our response to Jesus. Our new desire, it says this, these words go like this, it says, Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Take my moments and my days. Let them flow with ceaseless praise. Take my hands and let them move at the impulse of Your love. Take my feet and let them be swift and beautiful for Thee. Take my voice and let me sing always only for my King. Take my lips and let them be filled with messages from Thee. Take my silver and my gold, not a mite would I withhold. Take my intellect and use every power as Thou shalt choose. I wonder, are you holding on to your life? Whether you, whether you've come today as a believer or a not yet believer, the same thing can be true. We can try and be the master of our own destiny, that we can believe the lie that it's better to live life fully independent of God, out of relationship with Him, making our own choices about what's good and what's going to make me happy. He's calling us today to give our lives to Him. Acknowledge our need for Him. Maybe you're here today and as we've been talking about the reality of God and the reality of sin and how we've rejected Him, but also the good news of what He's offering us, forgiveness, eternal life, a restored relationship. You can say, yeah, that's me. I've been living my own way. I haven't experienced a baptism yet I haven't received I know that I'm far from God well there's an opportunity today the Bible says although your sins have have stained you like scarlet He's washing He wants to wash you whiter than snow that only Jesus can take away our sins make us new and you can receive that today and say yes I believe Yes, that's true about me. I'm sorry, Lord. Yes, I know that you love me. I want want you in my life. I want you to rescue me and put my feet upon the rock. And you can respond today. I want to lead you in a prayer, if that's you. And this is, I'm just going to ask people to raise their hand, if that's them, not to embarrass you. No one's looking around. This is just a way for me to be able to know who you are so I can pray with you. If that's you, I just want to wonder if you'd raise your hand and say, yeah, that's me. Would you, Sam, would you pray for me? I want God to be in my life today. Just raise your hand. Thank you, Lord. Yeah, for those who raised their hand, yeah, a couple of people raised their hand. That's awesome. And for those of you who are thinking along those lines and that's your heart's desire as well, then you can, then let's pray this together. Those who responded, but also the rest of us, let's pray this out loud together. God, I thank you for today. We can do better than that. God, I thank you for today. I thank you that there is good news for me. Although I am stuck in my sin, You died for me and I can be forgiven. Thank You for the new life through Jesus. Thank You for eternal life. Thank You that You've given me a new hope. Lord, I don't wanna live the the old way any longer. I want to live for You. Today, I give You my life. Make me a new person, I pray. And help me to live Your way.